Welcome to this presentation from Wessex Patient Safety Collaborative about Restore2, the physical deterioration and escalation tool for care homes. This presentation is intended to provide information about Restore2 for carers, trainers and managers to help with the adoption of the tool in all non-acute care settings. This presentation and associated slide deck may be adapted for local use providing the copyright requirements of all materials, including Restore2 and News2, is respected and appropriate acknowledgement given to West Hampshire CCG and Wessex Patient Safety Collaborative. Restore2 is a patient safety initiative co-produced by West Hampshire CCG and Wessex Patient Safety Collaborative. It's a physical deterioration and escalation tool for care and nursing homes. It's designed to support homes and health professionals to recognise when a resident may be deteriorating or to be at risk of physical deterioration, to act appropriately according to the resident's care plan to protect and manage the resident, to obtain a complete set of physical observations to inform escalation and conversations with health professionals, to speak with the most appropriate health professional in a timely way to get the right support, and to provide a concise escalation history to health professionals to support their professional decision making. These slides are based on the Restore2 Rollout Handbook. You don't need to have a copy of the Rollout Handbook, but you might find it useful to have a copy available in your care home for later reference. A number of terms are used throughout these training resources. Carers is a generic term referring to any member of staff in a residential or nursing home engaged in caring for a resident. DNA CPR refers to do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which are documents that state the resident should not receive cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and those are drawn up in conjunction with the residents themselves. NEWS stands for National Early Warning Score, or NEWS 2, as it's known at the moment. In this workbook, we use the terms residential and nursing to refer to all the different types of homes that provide care to residents. TEPs or treatment escalation plans are personalised recommendations for someone's medical care, which sets out how health conditions should be managed in the future if a resident deteriorates. And vital signs, also known as observations, are the measurements of essential bodily functions, such as breathing rate or respiratory rate, oxygen saturations, heart rate, also known as pulse rate, blood pressure, level of alertness and temperature. Restore2 was originally designed for use in care homes. However, they're now used in a multitude of settings, not all of which use the terms residents and care homes. We have developed versions of Restore2 Mini and associated training materials for those care sectors with appropriate terminology. However, this training resource is based on the original handbook and hence uses the terms resident and client throughout. Deterioration, including sepsis, is often recognised late sometimes too late and can have life-changing consequences. But what if we could identify it sooner? In hospital, in the emergency department, in the ambulance, at the GPs or in the care homes? And what if we all spoke the same language and could communicate our concerns better using accepted methodologies such as soft signs, news Two, and SBARD? which is what Restore2 does. Restore2 includes soft signs, News2 and SBARD. And this is what the full tool looks like, six pages of A4, starting with soft signs and what's normal and the escalation thresholds, the next two pages forming the observation chart and the final two pages being the SBARD escalation tool and action tracker. As we move through this presentation, we will reference the appropriate pages in the rollout handbook. As we said, we don't, you don't need a copy of the rollout handbook, but the reference is there. There are also a series of videos recorded and available on the Health Education England YouTube channel, and we'll give the references there. I'll talk more about those later. Restore2 is based on achieving a triad of clinical outcomes. If any one of us was unwell, we would want the following things to be in place to give us the best chance of a good outcome. We would want someone to recognise our deterioration early. We would want healthcare services to get to us as quickly as is required. And we want a clinical response that meets our needs. 
And these three things form the triad of clinical outcomes. So how does Restore2 work? Restore2 has five key components that support carers to recognise deterioration, assess the risk and act on the findings. We start by recognising early soft signs. We relate those to what's normal for the resident and taking into account there are any end of life care or agreed limited treatment plans they may have. The taking of those observations, the scoring according to the national early warning score and the escalation according to the score, according to how unwell the resident is. And then communicating those concerns using the SBARD escalation tool and action tracker. So let's start with soft signs. That's reference page 11 in the handbook and two specific videos, numbers 3 and 14. There are a lot of soft signs. One healthcare organisation managed to list over 120 different soft signs. And as a carer, you spend time with residents and can get to know them very well. Sometimes it can be obvious that someone is unwell. Other times the signs might be much harder to spot. And soft signs are the early indicators that someone might be coming unwell. You don't have to be a healthcare professional to recognise these signs. And as a carer, you're ideally placed to recognise small changes in your resident. Often family and friends will pick up on the subtle changes in a person's behaviour, manner or appearance. And family concern should always be taken seriously, even if you think the resident is fine. So there's different types of soft signs and they can be related to many things, including the resident's physical presentation, mental state or behaviour and ability. So examples of changes in a person's physical presentation could include being short of breath, not passing much urine, being hot or cold or clammy to touch or being unsteady when walking. Examples of changes in someone's mental state may include feeling more anxious or agitated, having new or worse confusion, or being more withdrawn than normal. And changes in behaviour and ability may include altered sleep patterns, increased tiredness, reduced inhibitions, or being very restless or hyperactive. And some soft signs are universal. For example, new onset or a shortness of breath or decreased urine output. And others may be unique to that person. For example, a sudden inability to participate in activities they enjoy doing, like doing the crossword, a particular change in behaviour, such as withdrawal, agitation or hyperactivity. By getting to know your resident, speaking with their family, friends and carers, you can build up a picture of soft signs that are significant to any, each particular resident. Some of these are broken down in the Restore2 tool, as you can see on the screen. And they're listed under those three categories of mental, physical or behavioural slash ability. It's not too important which they're in. What's more important is that you look out for them and notice them when they arise. It's good practice to ask the people you care for, how are you feeling today? Allow them time to answer the question in their own way and make a note of individual or unique soft signs in the residents' records for future reference. You should also encourage friends and family to tell you if they notice any soft signs. After all, they're going to know the, the resident even better than you do. Soft signs are particularly useful for residents who have difficulty communicating or understanding information due to dementia or learning difficulties. And by learning about soft signs, you may be able to recognise deterioration early and act to protect your residents from serious illness. Soft signs also lead on to using the National Early Warning Score, NEWS, as part of Restore2 and escalating your concerns to a healthcare professional or senior colleague. However, there are some occasions when the early signs of deterioration may be a medical emergency. In these cases, it's not appropriate to delay contacting the emergency services in order to record and use. It may be appropriate to monitor your residents' vital signs once you've contacted the emergency services, but you shouldn't delay in contacting the emergency services. Such situations might include things like chest pain or a suspected heart attack, where the imaging signs are consistent with having a stroke prolonged seizure, where the resident has a significant injury, i.e. a fracture or a head injury. At all times you should follow your own organisation's escalation and reporting procedures for medical emergencies. It's not the time to delay looking for soft signs or news scores. What's normal? This is covered in the handbook on page 15 in two particular videos, number three 
soft signs and number 14, recognising deterioration in people with a learning disability. As a carer, you may know your resident better than any other healthcare professional that comes into contact with them. So it's really important that when the resident is admitted to your home, you complete a set of vital OBS so that you know what is normal for them. You take time to learn about their usual behaviour so you know if they start doing things that are not normal for them. You understand their medical history, including any medications that they regularly take. You assume that they have the ability or capacity to make decisions about what they want, including when they become unwell. And if they don't have that ability or capacity, the appropriate measures are taken. You have a conversation with the resident's GP about when and in what circumstances the GP might want you to call them with a concern. Knowing your resident will help you to support them to live well. But also you need to think about what would happen if they become unwell and what they would like to happen if they become unwell. And this may include having a treatment escalation plan or do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation order. So to summarise, as a carer, you're ideally placed to recognise small changes in your resident. By getting to know your resident, speaking with their friends, family and carers, you can build up a picture of soft signs that are significant to each particular resident. And if a resident has a medical emergency such as chest pain, a heart attack or stroke, you should always still call, follow your organisation's procedures, including calling 999. Restore 2 can also be helpful in identifying when a resident is approaching the end of life. This can help to inform conversations with them and their relatives or GP. And once a resident is receiving care whilst dying, Restore 2 and physical observations may not be used so as not to cause unnecessary distress. So as a carer, you can support people in having those conversations about their end of life care preferences. And you can help them to arrange a treatment escalation plan with their GP. You should understand whether a treatment escalation plan and a resuscitation decision exists and what it says about that person's wishes. And you need to know where those documents are kept so you can access them in an emergency. A DNA CPR order does not mean that a resident cannot be treated for other conditions from which they may recover. For example, they may still benefit from antibiotics for an infection or first aid for an episode of choking. Restore 2 can be helpful in identifying when a resident is approaching the end of their life but may be discontinued once the person has an end-of-life care plan. Treatment escalation plans and resuscitations covered in the handbook on page 16 and in video number 13. A treatment escalation plan is a personalised recommendation for someone's medical care. It's for use in an emergency situation as a reference and communicates the level of intervention or de-escalation in the resident's clinical management. And a treatment escalation plan is made with the resident and their caring team and often with their family. It's ideally made when they are well and can say what they would want to happen. Knowing your resident will help you to support them to live well, but also to think about what they would like to happen if they become unwell. And when a resident you are caring for becomes unwell, there are different options for looking after them. If possible and safe, most residents would prefer to be treated in their own home. For some residents, it would be appropriate to call the GP or 999 to arrange admission into hospital. But for some people, going into hospital is not appropriate or in their best interests. This can be for a number of reasons. Often people who know they are approaching the end of their life may have decided they want to die in their own home and not in hospital if possible. And for others, perhaps where there's been a specific illness or event has happened, for example, a serious stroke, they may have previously expressed a wish to be looked after by people that know them in a way that maintains their dignity. There are helpful documents available that support residents to have a say in their care prior to when they become unwell. And these include treatment escalation plans or TEPs and do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation, DNA CPR documents. So to summarise, you need to know whether they exist and where they are kept and what they say. News and taking observations, handbook page 18, and there are seven videos specifically on how to take particular observations. We're not going to cover the actual taking the observations in this training video, that's often done by trainers face to face in your care home or on a course. But the news system itself was developed to help people assess how unwell someone is and to quickly recognise any deterioration so that treatment can be started promptly.
So we will just talk generally about the new score and each of the physiological observations, vital observations that uh, are covered by the new score. And mention some specific elements that are, that are relevant to the care home treatment. NEW stands for National Early Warning Score and it's a system that's widely used in healthcare settings around the United Kingdom and forms a common language. NEWS helps to quickly summarise how unwell a resident is in a way that is clear, concise and cannot be misinterpreted so that other healthcare professionals can prioritise their care effectively. The National Early Warning Score or NEWS is a number that is calculated from six observations or vital signs and these are breathing or respiratory rate, the level of oxygen in their blood, known as oxygen saturation, blood pressure, heart rate, also known as pulse rate, level of alertness, temperature. And in news, each vital sign is given a score based on the measurement. The score ranges between zero, which would be normal, and three, which is very abnormal. And two further points are given if someone is on oxygen therapy. News charts are color coded to help you add up the correct news. If you're using a paper chart, you should write the vital sign in the correct place. This is because the colour shows you how many points to score. In total, this gives a new score of between 0 and 20. The higher the score, the more unwell the person is likely to be. And you must have all six vital signs to calculate a new score. The total score is very accurate in predicting how unwell someone is. Observations are done in different times in different care homes. Many homes will take a set of vital signs and calculate a new score when the resident's first admitted or within 24 hours to help them understand what is normal for the resident. Other, other homes take observations on a monthly basis and there's, there's no reason why you can't use the new score to do your monthly observations. And the purpose of measuring vital signs is not to turn residential and nursing homes into mini hospitals. The home is the resident's own and shouldn't be overly medicalised. But Restore2 allows you to identify soft signs and early signs of deterioration, which trigger a set of vital signs specifically when a resident is unwell or is at risk of becoming unwell to help you share your concerns with others. So to summarise, NEWS helps you to quickly summarise how unwell the resident is in a way that is clear, concise and easy to communicate. You must have all six vital signs to calculate a NEWS score. And you must understand that what a normal news would be for your resident and be able to identify that a high news is likely to mean that a resident is unwell. Measuring vital signs. Any area where Restore2 is used will need to have the appropriate equipment available and staff who are trained to measure vital signs. You will need equipment such as a thermometer or something for taking temperatures, a blood pressure machine with cuffs of different sizes, finger probes or oxygen oximeters, color printed news charts or electronic devices with new software on them, and a timer or device that can time one minute. And all equipment should be regularly calibrated and checked and any problems reported immediately. Some good tips for taking observations are make sure the resident is relaxed and has rested for five minutes before measuring the vital signs. Always gain consent to take a reading and explain what you're going to do. You must have been appropriately trained to take physical observations and the equipment that, you, that is used must be clean and calibrated. Once you've measured a re resident's vital signs, you need to document it on the paper restore to chart or your electronic record. As I said, we're not going to teach the taking of uh, breathing or respiratory rate or any of the observations, but just some points that's worth uh, mentioning. As a vital sign, breathing is one of the observations that most accurately predicts a resident's outcomes and is one of the easiest to measure. A normal breathing rate is between 12 to 20 breaths a minute. A slow breathing rate may be due to taking a strong painkiller, such as morphine, or problems with the heart. And slow breathing can occur when a resident is awake or asleep. If someone is taking 25 breaths or more per minute, this is considered very significant and is worrying. Some patients, however, with long-term conditions such as COPD may have a higher rate of breathing than others. In these people, these uh, people, it's important to spot a change from their normal breathing rate. Again, other causes of high, a high breathing rate exist and include infection, asthma, exercise, anxiety or pain, and compensation for some other underlying disease or condition. 
So to summarize, a normal breathing rate is between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. You should always count a resident's breathing rate over a minute. I'm going to leave, I'm going to pass over the others because they will be covered in any training in taking the observations. But it's worth mentioning that even if the resident's overall news isn't high, we don't want to get into assessing people based on numbers. If you're worried about someone's breathing or any other aspect of their condition, you need to speak to a senior colleague or your manager and pass on your concerns. Oxygen saturations describe the level of oxygen in your blood and a normal oxygen saturation range is between 96 to 98 percent. And you can measure oxygen saturations with devices like a pulse oximeter using a probe that's usually placed on the end of someone's finger. These probes work by sending out waves of red and infrared light and they pass through the skin and blood vessels and onto a sensor on the other side of the probe. And in order for the probe to accurately measure oxygen levels, the resident must have a good pulse and a good fl pl blood flow to their fingers. Cold hands, dehydration or a dirty probe can make it difficult to get an accurate reading. Nail varnish and false nails can also adversely affect the reading. And you may need to talk to a senior colleague for advice on whether the resident's varnish or false nails need to be removed. In terms of taking the, re the, the reading, you need to make sure the equipment is clean and working. You select an appropriate finger, you ask the person to rest their hand and you allow the oximeter to take a reading, which usually flashes a bit before the numbers appear. A particular thing about oxygen scales is the oxygen levels is there's two scales for measuring it. Scale one is used for all residents, including people with res respiratory conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, unless you've been specifically instructed otherwise by a lung doctor or nurse. The second scale is for a group of people who live with a lower level of oxygen in their blood. These are people with certain lung conditions and the usual oxygen saturation range for them is between 88 and 92 percent, so much lower. If this is the case, it should be clearly written in their notes by their lung doctor or nurse, and you should use scale two to record their oxygen saturations. Otherwise, they'll assume they need oxygen levels between 96 and 98 percent. And the various levels are given in, in the scale on, on the screen, but that will be covered specifically in your training. It's worth noting that the people we're talking about who should be put on the scale two are the people who would come to harm if they were given extra oxygen. If you're using a paper chart, make sure that you cross through the scale that is not being used to avoid mistakes. You must also recall whether the reading has been taken while the person is breathing room air or is an oxygen therapy. And if so, it's worth recording how much oxygen they're being given. So to summarise, a normal oxygen saturation range is above 96%. For people with certain lung conditions, a normal oxygen saturation is between 88 and 92%. Warm the resident's hands before measuring their saturations if necessary. Do not use the probe on a resident's finger whilst taking their blood pressure on the same arm, as the blood flow will be cut off, giving a false error reading. Always check that you have the correct type of probe. Some probes are designed for specific use, i.e. on the ear. A wrongly placed probe may give an incorrect reading. You must not use scale 2 to record oxygen saturations unless you have a written instruction from a lung doctor or nurse to do so. Just because your resident has a chronic respiratory condition, this does not automatically mean that they need to be on scale 2. Make sure you cross through the scale that is not being used to avoid mistakes. And as with the previous observation, if you're concerned, raise, even, if the, even if the score isn't particularly worrying, if you're concerned, still pass on those concerns to a senior colleague or manager. Blood pressure, or BP, measures the force that your heart uses to pump blood around your body. A BP measurement includes two numbers, for example, 120 over 80. The top number, 120 in this example, is called the systolic blood pressure and is the pressure generated when your heart pumps. The bottom number, 80 in this example, is the diastolic blood pressure. This is the pressure when your heart is resting between beats. News only uses the top number and in news the normal range of systolic BP is between 111 and 219.
And although 219 seems very high, it's classed as normal until it goes above this level because many, particularly elderly residents, do have high blood pressure and may not be unwell. High blood pressure can be related to smoking, alcohol, being overweight or not getting enough exercise. If untreated, high blood pressure can increase the risk of developing headaches, heart disease, stroke and kidney disease. And many people will be on medication to lower their blood pressure for this reason. Having pain or being anxious can also increase blood pressure. Low blood pressure is less common than high blood pressure, but can be a sign that someone is becoming very ill. Low blood pressure may be a sign that someone isn't drinking enough or has become dehydrated due to vomiting or diarrhoea or that the resident has a serious infection that is starting to affect the way their heart is able to pump. Low blood pressure can be caused by certain medications, including being on too much medication for high blood pressure or due to problems with how well your heart squeezes. Blood pressure can be measured using manual or electronic devices. And there's some guidance there which will be covered in any training. Recording the blood pressure, if you're working with news, you only need the systolic BP, which is the top number. You should still chart all of the numbers and systolic blood pressure is scored in the following way. Uh, between 0 and 3, so between 111 and 219 is normal and the scale goes up to either under 90 or over 220 when it's a score of 3. So to summarise, for news, a normal upper systolic blood pressure is between 111 and 219. Low or falling blood pressure is often a late sign that a resident is very unwell. Make sure the resident has loose fitting clothes to push their sleeve up comfortably. Never take a blood pressure over layers of clothing and make sure the resident arm is supported and comfortable and the cuff is at the same level as the heart. Again, if you have any concerns, even if the blood pressure uh, score is naught, st still raise those concerns with an appropriate person. The heart rate or pulse rate is the number of times your heart beats in one minute. A normal heart rate is between 50 and 90 beats per minute, but it can vary. It can speed up or slow down depending on the situation. For example, someone's heart rate can go faster if they're developing an infection, exercising, anxious, dehydrated, in pain, or if the heart isn't pumping properly or regularly. And someone's heart rate can be slow due to medication, low temperature, or problems with the electrical circuit in their heart. A pulse can also either be regular or irregular. And if a pulse is regular, then each beat happens consistently and in, and in rhythm. But an irregular heartbeat feels different. It may feel like a skipped beat, or you may feel that the heart swaps from fast to slow. If a pulse is irregular and you haven't noticed this before, you need to inform your manager or a senior colleague. And there's several different ways you can measure someone's heart rate, and it's important you follow your own organisation's guidelines and use the equipment provided. If you felt an irregular pulse, you should document it in the notes and remember to tell your manager or a senior colleague if you have any concerns. Even if the rest of the residents' vital signs are normal, you must raise concerns about changes in their heart rate. And the scale is scored between 0, which is between 51 and 90, to a score of 3, which is 40 or less or 131 or more. So to summarise, a normal heart rate is between 51 and 90 beats a minute, but it can vary. Anxiety or pain can increase your heart rate. A person who's asleep will have a lower heart rate and you should still enter these onto your Restore To chart in the same way. And if you know your resident has an irregular heartbeat, the most reliable way to measure it is to feel someone's pulse in their wrist over 60 seconds. Level of alertness. A resident's level of alertness can change for many reasons. Sometimes this may be clear, such as the per person becoming confused or unresponsive. Other times there may be a less obvious change in behaviour, such as struggling to pay attention or remember things. And if someone suddenly becomes confused or less alert than normal, this could be due to an infection, a stroke or mini stroke, low blood sugar, a head injury, severe heart or lung problems causing low oxygen levels, or even an overreaction to a medication. Now it can be very difficult spotting confusion in someone who is already confused, has dementia, for example. But remember, what we're actually looking for is changes in levels of alertness, changes in from what they were like yesterday and the day before. And if you're not sure, still pass on the concerns.
Level of alertness is measured using the ACVPU scale. That stands for alert, newly confused, responsive only to voice, responsive only to pain and unresponsive. And the definitions are, are, are given there and that will be covered in, in your observation training. And again, it's scored from naught to three where if someone is, is alert, it's naught. And, and if they're not fully responsive, they score for three. So to summarize, the confusion part of the scale relates to new or worsening confusion. It is possible for someone to be normally confused, e.g. with dementia, but still to be alert. Ask yourself, is this resident more confused than before? If someone is scoring C, V, P or U, you need to ask for help. Temperature. Our bodies are normally very good at keeping our internal or core temperature within normal limits at around 37 degrees Celsius. You might hear it expressed as 37 degrees centigrade. Everyone has their own individual normal body temperature, which may be slightly higher or lower than this. A high internal temperature above 38 degrees Celsius is described as a fever, and fevers can be caused by infections, some medications, and overexposure to sunlight or heat stroke. And fever is the body's normal response to challenges like infection. A low internal body temperature might be related to being in a cold environment, but can also be caused by infections and certain conditions such as diabetes or thyroid disease. And a low core temperature is highly predictive of poor outcome in residents with infection. So taking the temperature will depend, you'll be covered in your local training uh, and you need to follow the processes and, the, and use the equipment provided. Temperatures scored between 0 and 3 and with normal being between 36 and 38 and 35 degrees or C being a score of 3. So to summarise, normal internal or core temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius. A low core temperature is highly predictive of poor outcomes. Ear thermometers are reliable but can under record the resident's temperatures if not used properly. And if the reading is abnormal but the resident appears well, check your equipment and technique and remeasure the, te the temperature. And as, a, as before, always pass on any concerns, even if, you're, even if the readings are fine but you're still concerned, raise your concerns with a senior colleague or manager. Recording observations. Each vital sign should be recorded on the, the paper restore to chart or entered onto an electronic observation system. If you're using a paper chart, then it needs to be printed in color to help you add up the correct news score. And when you're using a paper chart, you must, record, you must write the vital sign in the correct place because the color shows you how many points to score. Carefully add up the scores for each vital sign if the individual is on oxygen, they score an additional two points. And take care when manually adding up the news. Always recheck your work if possible. Check it using a downloadable news app. So to summarise, you must have all six vital signs to calculate a news. Make sure you carefully add up the numbers to reach the correct score. If you're writing the observations onto the chart, in addition to marking the point on the chart, make sure you write the number and make sure that both are in the same colour coded section to avoid confusion when adding scores up. Make sure you look at the trend, the way each observation is going up and down, as well as the absolute number and news. A news supports you to raise a concern, but never ignore your gut feeling, even if the news is normal. If you feel a person is unwell, always tell your manager or a senior colleague and also never rely on a single number. It's always about, it's, it's, you're looking for a trend in observations, in all, in all six observations. Escalation, covered in the, in the handbook on page 37 and on, in on video 13, treatment escalation plans and resuscitation. Depending on your local arrangements, different scores will require you to take different actions to raise your concerns. So you must know what's normal for a particular resident and be able to communicate to an appropriate person when someone's news is higher than usual. As a general rule, many people use the 357 when used in the community. That's to say a resident with a score of three can probably be managed in the community by local health services. A resident with a score of five is concerning and requires urgent review and a resident with a score of seven or above is likely to be very unwell and will probably require hospital care. However, you should always use those scores in accordance with your local procedures.
Remember, news is a communication tool that's used to support decision making. If you're a doctor or nurse, you must still use your clinical judgment to decide what care the resident needs and where this will be best delivered. If you're a carer, news helps you to understand how urgently you should be communicating your concern with a registered healthcare professional. And Restore2 provides you with detailed suggested actions to take based on the resident's news and examples of reasonable responses from healthcare professionals so you know what kind of outcome you should be expecting. As well as escalating your concerns, you must continue to monitor your resident in case they become more unwell and you need more urgent support, or perhaps they improve with treatment and need less. So to summarise, when you escalate, make sure you consider that what the resident's normal news is and how this is different from the current score. A resident with a score of three can probably be managed in the community by local health services. A score of five is concerning and requires urgent review. And a score of seven or above is likely to be very unwell and will probably require hospital care. If you're a doctor or nurse, you must still use a clinical judgment to decide what care the resident needs and where this would be best delivered. And of course, one should always consider any existing treatment escalation plan drawn up by the resident. You can also um, repeat observations more frequently if you're concerned even if the score isn't high. And there's some suggestions there below. So even if the score is naught, but you think you're concerned that something's not quite right, you could increase the OBS to, for example, 12 hourly. Or if their score's one, you could increase it to six hourly. But again, you need to follow your own local procedures for, for appropriate guidance. Communication, covered in the handbook on page 39 and covered in video 12, structured communications and escalation. We're going to be talking about ways in which you can communicate with other healthcare professionals, but it's essential that however you do that, you always follow your organization's reporting procedures. So it's essential you know what they are and you follow them. Being able to communicate effectively is a critical skill for everyone working with residents. There's little point in recognising deterioration in a resident if you're unable to communicate your concerns in a way that makes others take action to support you to manage your resident. And it can be difficult to communicate when you're under pressure or tired. It can be challenging communicating with so many different groups of people, including GPs, the ambulance service and community teams. So it's good practice to always try and plan your communication so you know what essential information you need to include. To assist you in getting your message across every time, Restore2 uses a structured communication tool called SBARD. This is easy to use and helps information to be transferred accurately and safely between people. SBARD stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, Recommendation and Decision. And the evidence shows that using SBARD helps with communication, confidence and patient safety. So to summarise, practice using SBARD every time you're handing over information to a colleague or healthcare professional and soon it will become more familiar to you. Have the SBARD template available next to the phone so that you can use it as a prompt when you need to. Once you've escalated your concerns, you must still continue to attend to the immediate safety and comfort of your resident. Carry out and document any of the actions you have been asked to take and remember to continue measuring the resident's vital signs to evidence any improvement or deterioration. So let's look more closely at each of the elements of the SBARD tool. S for situation. Start by explaining the current situation. Introduce yourself and state your role. Explain where you are calling from, who you are and whether you are a carer or a registered nurse. And what your direct phone number is in case you get cut off. Provide key information about the resident, including their full name, date of birth and NHS number. Explain what it is you are concerned about and use the National Early Warning Score to tell them what the resident's current news is and what would be normal for them. For the background, you might want to briefly state the resident's relevant medical history and what has got you to the point of calling for help. This should include medical conditions, any treatments or medicines that they are on, and whether they have an end-of-life care plan or any limitations to treatment. You could include the last GP review if relevant, any new medicines like antibiotics, test results that are awaited, the resident's last set of vital signs. For assessment, you can summarise what action you have taken so far and suggest what you think might be happening. If you aren't sure what is going on, don't let this put you off raising your concerns. 
You can include signs and symptoms, e.g. diarrhea, skin rash, pain, fatigue, any pain relief or other medications you have given, actions you've taken like repositioning the resident, other observations like urine output or blood glucose, blood sugar. And then for recommendation, think about what you would like to see happen next. This may include whether you want your resident to be seen by a healthcare professional and how quickly. You can also ask what actions you should carry out, either to manage the resident or whilst you wait for help to arrive. You could use phrases like, please could you, or I need you to, and what do I need to do next, or is there anything I need to do in the meantime? Finally, for decision, summarise your agreed management plan so that you are both clear on what each of you will do to care for the unwell resident. Importantly, remember to document this conversation in the care plan. You could use phrases like, we have agreed that you will, and I will do, and if there is no improvement within such and such a time, I will take such and such an action. This is really important both for you and people coming on in the next shift to know when a doctor has agreed to attend or other healthcare professional. And if they don't agree to attend by a certain time, you know when you can follow up with a phone call. In terms of calling an ambulance, you should always know your direct line telephone number so the call handler or healthcare professional can call you back quickly and easily without having to go to going through a switchboard or reception or other floor of your home. If possible, use a port or a mobile phone to make your call or a cordless phone. That way, if the ambulance service need to speak and see the resident, they don't have to hang up and call back on a different line. You may not be able to follow the SBARD structured communication tool when talking to the ambulance call handlers as they use NHS pathways, which take them through a specific questions in a certain order. However, by having planned your conversation, you should have all the necessary information to hand. It will still be helpful. Some ambulance services use a different structured communication tool called Atmist. You should use the communication tool you have been trained on and feel most comfortable with. If your resident needs to be admitted, make sure your Restore2 chart is copied for the crew and ask them to photograph it and upload it to their electronic patient record. Restore2 is your legal document. Don't send the original into hospital if you can help it. If you're using a digital version of Restore2, print the observations out for the crew to give the hospital. And just to flag um, this point about um, not being possibly not being able to follow the SBARD communication tool when speaking to the ambulance call handlers. Um, some people have felt that the ambulance crew aren't, aren't listening to them when they try and use SBARD, but it is because each answer you give them leads them on a flowchart to a different question, so they cannot follow the SBARD communication tool with you. But as I say, the the advantages of using SBAR means that you still prepare for the call and you're able to give the information in an organised fashion. So it's still useful preparing your information in an SBAR format before calling the ambulance. Just a mention about Restore2 Mini. This training presentation is about Restore2, the full News 2 based tool. But there are versions of Restore2 Mini which you might come across in your own organisation or hear of in other organisations. So it's worth knowing what it is uh, and what it's covered. There is also a, a training resource similar to this on Restore2 Mini uh, and you, you can return to that for more information. So we talked about how Restore2 worked, these five elements from soft signs round to SBARD. Restore2 Mini doesn't use the news to um, measurement of observations and the, and the escalation process based on the news score. It starts in just the same way with the early identification of soft signs. It compares those with what's known as to be normal for that resident, taking into account any end of life care or agreed limit of treatment plans that may be in existence. And then raises those concerns, if, if there are any concerns, raises those to uh, another healthcare professional using SBARD. This is what Restore2 Mini looks like. It's two sides of an A5 card with the soft signs on the one side and the SBARD message on the other side. There are three different versions at the moment with others being developed um, of Restore2 Mini. There's this, the, the first one for care homes, which includes nursing and residential homes. There's one for domiciliary care settings, 
which refers to home and clients rather than care home and residence. It's that, which is pretty much the only difference. The soft signs are the same and the SBARD process is the same. And then learning disabilities refers to the person you support. And again, the content of the cards is, is virtually identical, which it, which is the same, it is identical. So we're now going to look at some scenarios, how we can put this into practice. And that's covered in Rollout Handbook, page 42. However, this presentation has been developed to support the online delivery of training rather than face-to-face -face sessions. So we are using different scenarios to those in the handbook. So let's look first at David, who's a 67-year-old gentleman who lives in your nursing home, primarily because of his poorly controlled diabetes. He's a double leg amputee and sometimes uses a wheelchair. He often stays in his room and when his blood sugars are high, he gets headaches, becomes increasingly tired and feels very thirsty. He also gets very grumpy. So take a moment to think about how you would view these soft signs. We've got increased drinking, more withdrawn, tired and drowsy, increased urine output, grumpy and headaches. You can put them into these, you, you can look at them under these categories we talked about earlier, physical, mental and behavioural. But it doesn't matter. These are all things you've observed in David, who you know well, that is different from how he usually is. Um, and remember, we can't rely on any, any single one. So he might be, um, he might be, he might increase his drinking because of his diabetes. He might just have been out to party with, with friends and, uh, and had more, more to drink and then he might have more increased urine output. So it's about understanding what's going on and not relying on any single sign or symptom, but equally being confident that when you see something different and raising your concerns that something might be wrong. So Molly's a fun and outgoing 78 year old. She mobilizes with a Zimmer frame and loves to socialize with other residents and staff. When she's not talking, she's usually found reading and you can often find her with her head in a book in the conservatory. She often jokes that she's too busy to sleep. She goes to bed late and tends to get up early, often having a cup of tea with the night staff before they go off duty. So again, let's look at some soft signs that you've observed in the last day or so about Molly. You think she's less able to mobilize, more withdrawn, less sociable, less able to concentrate, decreased fluid intake, tired and sleepy, less able to read, more time in bed. So this is an example of someone who doesn't normally read, the fact they're not reading is not significant. But for Molly, she's a keen reader. So if she's not interested in reading, then you might think, well, what's going on there? So the ability to observe, the, the better you know someone, the more you can sit, observe the subtle signs, the subtle soft signs. So again, categorizing them, we could say there's, there's some physical signs. She's less able to mobilize, has decreased fluid intake. Mentally more withdrawn, less sociable, less able to concentrate, less able to read. And behavior wise, more tired and sleepy and spending more time in bed. Again, key message, don't rely on any single one. But if you're concerned, these are the sorts of things that might my, 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 and this is without observations. This is without doing your blood pressures and your heart rates and so on. This is these are the sorts of things that might indicate the molly is not as well, is deteriorating, and you can be confident in in sharing those and raise with 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 colleagues with your with your senior colleagues and your managers. So Simon's an 81 year old resident. He's been in your home for two years, and you know him very well. He's always very cheerful, engaging, but he has dementia. He's trouble remembering where he is and has to be supported to take his medication. However, he always recognises his daughter when she visits and loves talking about old memories with her. Sam's physically well and only takes medicines and tablets to lower his blood pressure. He's prone to chest infections and has just in case antibiotics in the home. When you see Simon today, you think he looks more withdrawn. His daughter tells you that he struggled to recognise her and thought that she was his mother. He sounds chesty, so you sit him up. His observations are below, so take a moment to think how you might use SBARD to communicate your concerns. And the observations are listed there. Um, 
basically the news from that is five and his normal is naught or one. He has a treatment escalation plan that states he's not for resuscitation, but he's for full medical treatment of any reversible illness. And that includes being admitted to hospital for treatment. So Simon, Keith, so let's look at the soft signs. He's always very cheerful and engaging, but today he looks more withdrawn. He always recognises his daughter. But his daughter tells you today that he struggled to recognise her and thought that he was, she was his mother. He's prone to chest infections, and that's just in case antibiotics. And today he sounds chesty, so you sit him up. So there's quite a lot going on here with, with Simon. And his physical observations are there, so we're now include, we've moved on to taking the observations. And the specific ones um, are breathing, 24, which is the news of 2, and his new, new onset of confusion, so his the score of 3, which adds up to a score of 5 with a normal for him of naught or one. And also relevant to the SBARD is that he has a treatment escalation plan that states he is not for resuscitation, but is for full medical treatment of any reversible illness. So let's look at the SBARD. There's no correct answers for this. And don't worry if you put some of your comments in the assessment in, instead of the background. But just as an example, it might sound something like this. My name is XX and I'm calling from Sunny Holly Hollow Residential Home and I'm a carer. My direct number is this. I'm calling about Simon, an 81 year old resident with a news of five. His normal is naught or one. I'm concerned that he is chesty with a higher than normal breathing rate and more confused and withdrawn than usual. So there's a lot of those soft signs in that those, those very few words cover the news, the breathing rate, the confusion and the withdrawn. The background, he has dementia, he always recognises his daughter, but today struggle to recognise her. He has a DNA CPR in place, but it's for full treatment of any reversible illness, including hospital admissions. He's currently on blood pressure medication only. He does have antibiotics in the home. He's deteriorated in the last 24 hours and his observations are. So again, lots of information there in, in very few words. Talking about recognising his daughter, having a DNA CPR in place, chest infections, antibiotics, recent deterioration and observations. So whether you're talking to a senior colleague or a GP or an ambulance crew, that this is very condensed information, very clear. In your assessment, I think he has a chest infection. I have set him up. Again, we're not asking you to diagnose these conditions. The doctor or the ambulance crew will do that. You're saying, I think he has a chest infection. Nothing wrong with saying that and the actions you've taken. And those are all highly relevant. And again, how many words? Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Something like twelve words. Uh, very short and brief, and um, passing the message over. The decision. Some people include D documented, but obviously you can only document it after. You can prepare the other things beforehand, but you can only document the decision after you've spoken to whoever you're going to speak to. But you would say, please, can you come and see him in the next hour? I will repeat his, his observations in 15 minutes. Would you like me to start his antibiotics? Um, so again, another another element. Um, you're asking for a particular decision as part of his uh, part of the SBAR communication. So Charlie, um, this is a supported living flat scenario. Um, 67 year old gentleman is generally fit and well, full capacity, but reduced mobility. He's on medication for hypertension only and has not required medication review since moving to the flat. One morning you notice that Charlie's reluctant to eat his breakfast and feels he needs to go back to bed for a rest. When you check on Charlie an hour later, you feel his hands are colder than normal and he's beginning to shiver. Charlie has also informed you he does not feel very well. Take a moment to think about how you would use the SBAR framework to communicate your concerns about Charlie to the GP. So again, um, let's look at this. He's reluctant to eat his breakfast. He feels he needs to go back to bed for a rest. These are the subtle signs, the soft signs, the subtle changes that are different in Charlie today from how he's how he usually is. When you check on him, his hands are cold and normal. He's beginning to shiver and he doesn't feel very well. Again, no correct answers. So don't worry if you if you put some of the information in different sections. It, just important that you've spotted the, 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 the important things and you've got them into the message in a clear and concise way. 
might sound something like this. My name is whatever, and I'm ringing because I'm worried about a person I'm a carer for. This is my number. We've been supporting Charlie for the last three months, and he's generally fit and well. I've become concerned as he's off his food, unusually lethargic, cold and shivering, and is complaining of feeling unwell. Charlie is 67-year-old and alert with full capacity. He's on medication for hypertension, but no other medication. He has not required medical review since we met him. I am not sure what the problem is, but Charlie's condition is deteriorating. Absolutely fine to say you're not sure what the problem is. You're concerned you want someone who can come and diagnose to come and have a look. Um, so it's absolutely right and proper that you do so. You don't have to know what's wrong to pass on your concerns. And people say using this communication tool, um, they're, they're treated, um, sometimes they feel they're treated with more respect and they're, 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 their concerns are taken more seriously and they're, they're more often acquired to get the to achieve the result that they're looking for uh, attendance by a doctor the same day or an ambulance in a certain time period that's the feedback from the carers using tools like these so the recommendation or the uh, decision uh, the recommendation for the decision please could you visit to review charlie is there anything i can do whilst i'm waiting for you and in, in, as a result, the GP agrees to visit in the next two hours after surgery, i.e. between four and six. That's a lovely clear message you can give. So don't 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 chase the doctor up before four o'clock because he said he he would come after surgery. But it, that should be between four and six. So if it's much later than that, perhaps we should call to check he's not forgotten. And we will continue to monitor and call the GP again if his condition changes before the GP arrives. There are some examples for doing the new score in the handbook. I'm not going to cover those now. That will be covered in your local training. Um, and you, you can go and look in the handbook if you want to and look at some of the examples. Um, so, so there are some examples of doing news calculations. I'm not going to cover those in, in this, this um, training video. Competency-based assessment. Um, this is covered on, on the handbook on page 48, and this is optional. Um, it's not a requirement of Restore 2 that people use a competency-based uh, approach to the training of taking observations. Um, but if you do want to use uh, a competency-based approach, there is an example template in the rollout handbook um, if, if, for you to, to, to develop and by all means copy it and, and use it or amend it to suit your local situation. Additional resources and recommendations. Um, we've mentioned these videos throughout. So Wessex HSN and the West of England HSN collaborated with West Hampshire CCG and Health Education England to produce a series of short free videos and e-learning materials to support staff working in care homes to care for residents who are at risk of deterioration. There's 14 of them and they can be, the, they can be reviewed either on Health Education England's e-learning for health if you do have a uh, an account, but um, they can also be viewed on the Health Education England YouTube channel. The link is on this screen and there are 14 of them. They're all around about three minutes. They're all short and each cover a specific topic and they're, they're delivered by professional actors working to the script provided by uh, the medical people uh, and they're, they're a really good way of um, learning about a topic supporting what you've heard on this video, um, supporting any training you might get um, locally, and they're great to go back and to check up on uh, later on. Um, so you have the training and you can't remember what was said, you can go and check in the video uh, at any time. Seven of those videos were filmed specifically to support carers of people with a learning disability, and they are, those also are on the Health Education England's website and the link, the link is there and all, all 21 videos can be accessed on the Health Education England YouTube channel. Taking the 14 videos, if you wanted to look at them in relation to specific elements, so for example, spotting serious illness and sepsis, um, the best video to watch is Introduction to Sepsis. If you want to know more about soft signs, uh, there are three videos in particular, um, taking observations, there are a number there, and then um, two on escalation and communication. So that just gives you a hint which videos might be best um, for which bit. And of course, been referencing them throughout this video. This video. 
We're continuously developing more resources for care homes and, and the, they can be found on the Wessex Patient Safety Collaborative website and you can get the links from uh, the screen here uh, and also the slide deck that you, that's, this is based on. Restore2 has been recommended by a number of healthcare organisations including the British Geriatric Society, the, the LEADER, the Learning Disability and Mortality Review Programme, the CQC, DHSE, NHSE and PHE guidance on the admission of care residents in a care home includes reference to Restore2 and it's being implemented by patient safety collaboratives and care homes across England. The videos um, at this point of, uh, in this, at the point of recording have been viewed over 400,000 times. That's in just over a year. And Restore2 has also received a number of awards. Um, it's been recommended by our colleagues for use in clinical situations. And we just like to acknowledge the uh, contributions made by the people listed below in the uh, development of Restore2. That completes our presentation about Restore2, the physical deterioration and escalation tool for care and nursing homes. If you want to go back to any part of the video to spend more time on any particular point or to take note of the link shown on the screen, then you can rewind to the point of interest and even pause the video while you do so. Please feel free to contact us at Wessex Patient Safety Collaborative if you have any questions or you would like to be put in touch with your local patient safety collaborative. Thank you for listening. We hope you found it useful.